Good evening and welcome to Hard Fire. I'm your host, Joseph Dobrian, here with you for another half hour of current events and politics from a libertarian perspective. My guest this evening is Sasan Sadat Sharifi, a libertarian talk show host based in Austin, Texas. Sasan, good evening. How are you doing down there? Not bad. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. And uh, how's the good libertarian fight going in Austin? Better than New York, I hope. Well, I hope so. I, Austin's always had a, a pretty strong libertarian community, so I think there's more people around here that agree with me than disagree with me. At least I, I like to think so. Well, my gosh, you're in an enviable position in that case. But speaking of disagreements, um, now that I've got you here on the show tonight, what I would like to talk with you about is how do you handle disagreements? How do libertarians in general handle disagreements? Because we are always having to face non-libertarians who sometimes ask us very tough and very sensible questions that are hard for us to answer. And um, you claim that you've got to come back for just about everything, so uh, I'm going to put you to the test tonight. Um, what's the first thing that you say to somebody who doesn't really know much about what libertarianism is about? Of course, the first question they always ask is, uh, are you involved with that Lyndon LaRouche guy? And then after that, uh, then you have to explain yourself, right? Well, I, I try not to use uh, technical terms on speaking to people. I, I try not to go the technical route and, and throw out phrases out there like uh, physical non-aggression truths because most people don't care about that. They're too bored by that. Uh, people ask me what a libertarian is. It's basically someone believes in live and let live. You know, you're free to do whatever you want as long as you're not harming someone else. That's, that's the gist of it, I think. Okay, that sounds very good, but I'm going to play devil's advocate through this show, and you, you just uh, punch me up as, as best you can. Um, now, libertarians don't believe in government, isn't that right? Well, not all. Uh, I personally don't believe in government, but there's different levels of libertarians out there. Uh, most libertarians, I think, can agree that government is a bad thing, and the less, the better. Uh, but most aren't willing to take it to what I think is a logical conclusion of no government at all. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, one of the reasons is people have this nagging belief, this myth, that somehow freedom is chaos and control is stability. And it's really the other way around. I think that's the main thing. Okay. Well, um, how can you convince me that uh, freedom doesn't equal chaos? Now, I, as devil's advocate, I'm going to tell you that I think people are just not fit to govern, govern themselves. They are too weak and too stupid and too wicked. Well, what brings out the worst in people, I think, is caging them with laws, kind of like caging an animal brings out the worst in it. You know, what should be a, a docile animal, a peaceful animal, becomes aggressive, angry, distrustful. The same thing happens when you cage humans, because basically what you're doing is insulting them by governing them. You're telling them you're too weak, you're too stupid to be trusted, and so now we have to have this artificial authority figure in your life to keep you in check because you can't be trusted. And when you treat people like that, they're going to act like that. That's just the way they are. Okay, but you're just assuming, aren't you, that everybody is going to be good? No, not really. Uh, I think most people are born with the idea of live and let live, that you can do whatever you want as long as you're not harming someone else. Statism helps to undo that logic. Uh, statism teaches us that it's okay to demand from others, that it's okay to have authority in life, because without it, we just descend into chaos. We'd just be, you know, apes throwing feces at each other. Okay, well, a lot of people would say that uh, the government does have a right to, d to demand from us, because after all, what's going to happen to the really poor people who cannot feed and clothe themselves if the government doesn't look after them? What do you say to that? Well, see, that's a reaction to a situation that doesn't get to the root. I like to talk about what causes poverty in the first place. I like to strike the root. And usually what causes poverty is government intervention in the markets. Uh, this idea that somehow if the government doesn't intervene, then corporations will run wild and, and run over us. Well, well, sure. That uh, A lot of people would say, well, my gosh, if we didn't have a government enforcing a minimum wage, why then 
these hideous evil corporations would be paying all of their workers 40 cents an hour and expecting them to live on that. What do you say to that? Well, I'll say to that, let's, find, let's look at the reasons why companies can't pay their workers more. First of all, there's this hostility, open hostility between the workforce and the employer brought about by government. There's this distrust that somehow you can't let your guard down around each other. But one of the main reasons I think that keeps employees, or I should say employers, from treating their employees properly is the lack of competition. And also the fact that they're overburdened with regulation, overburdened with taxes. Uh, if companies didn't have to pay taxes, they can afford to pay their employees more. Also the cost of their goods would cost less, which means your money would go farther. And also employees went tax, which means they would have more money left over. So you see government or taxation in general pretty much screws everybody at all levels. Okay, but uh, if I'm an employer, I'll be frank with you, if I'm an employer, I'm going to pay my employees as little as I can get away with. But, here's the thing, government does not encourage competition. Over and over again you hear about these government programs designed to help small businesses encourage competition. They do the opposite. They provide the well-connected employers a means to cut off the competition by infiltrating regulatory bodies or using eminent domain to get proper they normally wouldn't have got. And also this taxation of regulatory burden prevents other companies from rising up as well. So what I'm saying basically is the more companies there are to choose from as an employee, the more competitive these companies are going to be when they're offering you wages, offering you benefits. The way it is now, there's only so much work available. And if you don't like the wages, you don't like the, condition, the conditions, well tough, what are you going to do? Under a pure free market, there's plenty of jobs to go around. If you don't like the way where you're at, you can go find another job. Okay. Now, uh, what about infrastructure? Some people are going to ask you, well, my gosh, if we don't have taxes to maintain the, uh, the subway system, the interstate highways, the, uh, the bridges and tunnels, uh, uh, how are we going to manage? Now, that's what I've actually been researching for the past couple months because that was... When talking to libertarians, that's one of the main issues they have with their not being governed. They say, well, if there's not government around, how are we going to get anywhere? Who's going to build the roads? Who's going to maintain them? Well, if you look at history, uh, this idea of state building and controlling the roads, it, it's not, it's, it hasn't always been there. Take a look at medieval England, back around 1280, 1300 AD. All of the roads were privately built, privately maintained. Uh, by the owners of the property they were on. Okay, yes, I'm aware of that, but are you advocating a return to medieval times, feudalism? Uh, <laughs> See, no, that's, that's so the forth? thing. The thing is, I'm saying that government had nothing to do with it. They kept out of it, and it still happened. The government had nothing to do with roads. And the reason it happened, well, let's put it this way. A lot of libertarians say, well, if all roads are private, well, then the, the owner of that road could re technically restrict access to that road. They could not allow free travel. And that's true. Technically, that could happen. But that's not what happened. In reality, even though the roads were private, the landowners still allowed people to travel freely on their roads because they understood if they allow other people to use their roads, people in turn would be obliged to let them use their roads as well. That's just the way it was. There was no government enforcement, yet there was still a working infrastructure. Okay, then let's talk about the administration of criminal justice. That's one that has always run me right up a stump because I dare say I am just as radical a libertarian as you are, but uh, I try and take a pragmatic approach and uh, I find it very, very difficult to imagine a workable criminal justice system under a libertarian government. Now, maybe you could explain how you would do it. I've, had, I've heard people argue to me that, you know, without a police force, without government, it would be hard to track down criminals and hold them accountable. That may be true, I'm not going to argue that, but what I'd like to focus on is what creates crime in the first place. I, like I said, I like to get at the root. I don't like to put little temporary band-aids on things. So what creates crime in this country? Well, like I said before, when you cage people, it brings out the worst of them. Uh, the most common example I can think of is the war on drugs. That is probably the most destructive domestic policy this country's ever had. Or basically what you have here is instead of just a few people or a small portion of people getting high, possibly using dangerous drugs, now what you've done is criminalized it. 
And so that hasn't gotten rid of the dangerous drug use, it's just made it worse. Now because you've criminalized an addictive substance, now you have drug gangs, now you have overflowing prisons, now you have uh, cops stopping over your civil rights. Uh, you have all these other disastrous consequences and it doesn't solve the problem of drug use. Okay, well I agree with you all the way about that and uh, if you like we can get back to the war on drugs in a moment. But what I'm curious about is um, crimes that involve the initiation of force or fraud. For example, if I go out and uh, rape somebody or if I uh, knock her down and steal her money and um, may maybe knock out a few of her teeth or something like that. Now that, that is an initiation of force. That's definitely a crime in anybody's book and I should think that I should have to be punished for it. Now what would that look like in your idealized libertarian system? Well, the, the, the first place, under a system of no government, I would argue these crimes are much less likely to happen, but they will still happen. So what do you do? Well, the person, the person that was wrong has the right to retaliate. And that's not a system that needs to be enforced by government. That's the natural order of things. Either they will retaliate or their friends and family will reta re uh, retaliate on their behalf. Oh, I see. So, um, so this, this uh, woman who's maybe five foot tall and 98 pounds, she's authorized to come at me with a, ha with a hatchet if she can find me after I've raped her, uh, even though she may be permanently disabled, uh, or her family would be allowed to lynch me, but the government is not going to do anything about it. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm saying under a system of, of no government, that's what would happen. There would be the right to retaliation, and it would be up to the court of public opinion to decide whether that retaliation is just or not. Uh, it seems to me, though, that if her family were big enough and influential enough, then they could do whatever they wanted to me, whether or not I had actually done anything wrong. I mean, what if they got the wrong guy and they lynched some fellow who had nothing to do with it? But they're big and powerful enough that nothing would happen to them. Where, but where does the influence come from for a family that big? If you become influential, if you become powerful in a system without government, it's because you're well liked, you're well accepted, you're doing things that are right for the community. Or so because you terrorize the community. That? Hmm? Or because you terrorize the community. Well, that's the thing. If everyone's well armed in the system, no government, which they probably would be, no one would dare do that. There would be a revolt. Uh huh. Okay, so um, it sounds like you are um, assuming a tremendous degree of trust. Uh, do you think that a system like this could be implemented? Uh, within say, See, I, I want to stop you right there. I want to stop right there. You said a system can be implemented. There is no system to implement. That's the whole point of this thing. There's nothing that has to be okay. enforced. Okay, this is fine. Human Let's nature. use your terminology then. Could we, practically speaking, abolish all government, say, within a 10 year period from now, and have things work out pretty well as far as you're concerned? Well, those are logistics, and I haven't actually try to figure out how um, government could be eliminated, abolished. My main concern is to convince people that government knowledge is not necessary, but it's the most destructive force mankind has ever just, uh, created. As far as practical ways to eliminate government, you know, step by step to, to lessen the blow, I couldn't tell you that. It, it's, it's pretty complex. I haven't actually gone into that. Well, now that is a problem that a lot of libertarians face because it's all very nice for us to talk about uh, how we would like to abolish government or at least uh, cut it to the bone. But we're kind of short on practical solutions, aren't we? And that's where the authoritarians, or at least the non-libertarians, will trip us up every time. Um, in my opinion, we've got to start coming up with at least some theoretical solutions to satisfy these people, because if they don't hear them from us, they're going to be very skeptical, and I won't blame them. Well, I, I have heard solutions before, and there's a lot of libertarians out there that call themselves constitutionalists. And part of their game plan, at least some of them, is to return this country back to the level of the Constitution, and once it's down there, then to try and eliminate government. But I think if you promote the Constitution too much, you're in fact giving credibility to government. You're giving credibility to the idea that we need some sort of authority father figure in our lives telling us what to do, or else we'll just you know, devolve into primates. Okay. Well, I, I think, think that, uh, in my opinion, there's got to be some law, if only thou shalt not initiate force or fraud. Well, um, see, that's not something that needs to be enforced. That's just something understood. Just consider... 
when you, when we were kids on the playground and a, some kid shoved another kid and the teacher saw it what's the first thing those kids said they said he started it no he started it they yeah. understood even from that age that when someone initiates aggression against you they are at fault and there must be a consequence but what did that teacher do they didn't say they didn't care who was, who was at fault what no, the they, teacher yeah, the told te them was it doesn't problem. matter the teacher who's is at fault. a microcosm of the worst uh, aspects of our government because the teacher is going to say I don't care that he hit you hey, first you're not that's supposed exactly to hit right him back. And that's exactly right and that's where we unlearn what we learn what we know from birth what is instinctive and that's really the cause of most of our problems okay but um, I, I still am interested in how um, we would dismantle the government for example um, if uh, if I said that um, starting from now the um, the public roads are all up for auction. Whoever wants to uh, assume the responsibility of maintaining them may buy them from the government. And we will then use those proceeds to help dismantle the government further. Okay, now what happens to the roads? How do people use them? How are they maintained? Yeah, that's a very good question. As far as how they're maintained, uh, first of all, they can be much less expensive to maintain than they are now because you don't have all the regulatory agencies breathing down your back. Uh, as far as are they can be profitable to maintain? Absolutely. If a company maintains or owns a road, it's in their best interest to maintain it. Think about it. All parking lots for shopping centers, they're all private roads. They're all maintained by the shopping center because they know it's in their best interest. Uh, our highways uh, could be ad revenue supported. They could be supported by the billboards on top of them. And they could even have toll roads. Now, I, know, I don't know if you know this, but in Texas, toll road is a bad word. But the I don't reason think anybody is, likes toll roads. We have but the reason York, toll roads are a bad word. Either. The reason toll roads are a bad word is because the government uses its power of eminent domain to kick people off their land and then turn it over to a private company that charges people a fee for a road they already helped to build. That's why it's evil. Under a system of no government, tolls are not evil. Okay. Uh, now uh, let's. You mentioned eminent domain just now. Let's go to that for a moment. Now, uh, I, I think, as a fellow libertarian, that eminent domain is a totally evil proposition. I agree. But, but let's look at this. For example, uh, supposing I'm a crotchety old man who lives in a shack in the middle of a, an area that somebody else, perhaps even the government, would like to develop. Now, all the other landowners in that area have sold their land willingly enough, but I'm stubborn. I'm not going to give up my land. So under eminent domain, the government can take it, and pay me what they claim is a fair price, whether it's a fair price or not, and I'll be out of luck. But now, supposing we had a system in which there was no eminent domain and no government to protect property rights. Why then, if I was that crotchety old man who refused to sell my property, I would be taken out in the dead of the night and beaten to death, and my shack would then be pulled down, and then the development would go right ahead. What do you have to say to that? I would say that any company has a reputation to maintain uh, they're not going to do that because if they do that there will be huge retaliation against them by in who? other words people will not buy their products if it's known that they're oppressing people uh -huh. well uh, you're, you're taking an optimistic approach I'll say that Well, I've, I've seen it I've, I've worked in a, the retail industry and, and I've watched uh, the department heads whenever a customer has a complaint about something whether it was a service the company provided or a product they provided, the customer always, always got what they wanted, whether they deserve it or not, and it wasn't because the law was forcing us to do it. It was because we, we took out our calculators and we calculated, okay, if that customer gets mad, decided to shop here again, how much money is that going to cost us in the long run? Yes, and we I discovered that. that. That makes sense. But now supposing that everybody else in that town wants that development to go ahead, and everybody else in that town is really angry at me, the crotchety old man who is refusing to sell his shack so that that development can go forward. I don't have a friend in that town. Does that make it okay for, for them to take me out and beat me to death and knock down my shack? No, I don't think that's going to happen in, in the first place. And if, if, it, if there is a crotchety old man they're refusing to give up their property, well, they're just going to have to go around. And I, I don't think that citizens are going to stand around and, and let a company run over uh, one of their neighbors. I, I wouldn't, even if I disagree with them. I, it, it's just not right. Well, it, it's not right. I agree with you. But uh, I, I think that if we were to bet on that proposition, I'd take the other end of the bet. 
But now let's go to another point that you brought up when you're talking about your career in retail, and that is consumer protection. Right. You know, uh, there are an awful lot of unscrupulous businessmen out there, and then there are also a lot of businessmen who are perfectly honest, but just incompetent, and they make bad mistakes like, you know, accidentally selling you poisoned food. Right. Um, if we don't have uh, government oversight of, um, of food, of utilities, and so forth, then uh, aren't we going to see a lot more of that kind of thing? You know, I think that government oversight, these regulatory bodies, give us a false sense of security. They, they tell us to turn our brain off and just assume, okay, if it's on the market, it must be safe. I'll just buy it just because the government has allowed it onto the shelf. And on top of that, not only does that uh, encourage consumers to make poor choices, there are other ways to monitor the products in this country. Take Consumer Reports, for example. Consumer Reports uh, runs on a subscription. It's not ad-supported. If you are concerned that a product may be harmful, or if, even if you don't know if it's going to be a good product or not, you pick up your magazine, you go to their website, and you research it first. That's the kind of thing uh, that would happen independent of a government all the time. But like I said, people are getting complacent because they have this false security blanket of government. Okay, but then would you argue that um, it's, it should be a matter of let the buyer beware, and if people don't take the, uh, the proper precautions when, when buying goods or services, then they should just um, expect, expect the uh, worst consequences? Well, yeah, that, that's just going to happen. And on top of that, you know, I, would, I would argue that, yes, uh, people should expect uh, to be railroaded if they don't pay attention. But like I said before, one of, the ways, one of the reasons companies act as evil as they do today is because of the system of government we're in. Because in this government we're in right now, this economy we're in, which is not a free market, how successful you are now as a business owner is not necessarily determined by how happy you make your customers. It's determined by how well you infiltrate the government and bend the laws to your favor. And what you'll find is a lot of people attempting to hold companies accountable nowadays are running into a brick wall of government stopping them from doing it. That brick wall would be removed and common sense would prevail. Okay, well, I hope you're right. Uh, and I hope we see the day. But uh, let me ask you about another subject, and that is education. That's uh, something that you're going to be asked about a lot by people who don't agree with this. And that is, you know, how about the children? It's always about the children, you know. Um, how are we going to educate them if in a libertarian society if there, is no, if there are no public schools? Especially, how are the poorest kids who cannot afford private schools going to be educated? Well, first off, I want to say that my mother is a public school teacher, so I'm not against teachers. I am, however, against government schools because it's not education. Uh, government education is actually socialization. It's actually preparing a child to function properly in the society that we're in. Oh, and yes, that's not a conspiracy entirely, but theory. At least that, they're taught to read, write, and figure, at least to a certain extent. Right, but they're also taught to accept statism and authoritarianism at the same time. They're, they're taught to accept the society they're in that's not... Okay, uh, real what education. do we do without public schools? That's the, the question I'm trying to get answered here. Now, as far as private schools go and kids not being able to afford it, well, first of all, I don't know if you know this, I, I was in the military, and I saw over and over again, government contractors always get way, way, way more money than they deserve for a service. The same thing goes with any public service. School, public school right now, as it is, is much, much more expensive than it would be under free market economy. Well, then and if the teachers kids, are always complaining that they're underpaid. Right, but see, the products, the products are what cost so much, not the teachers, the products, the actual school supplies. But even if under free market, even though school costs much less, even if a child still couldn't pay for it, which they probably would, uh, there are private charities to help out with that. Okay. Uh, how about if the parents just don't, don't give a rat's patootie whether their kid is educated or not. I think there are plenty of parents around who don't want to be bothered sending their kids to school. They are perfectly willing to let the kids flake out 24 hours a day in front of the TV. Would you compel them to educate their children? Uh, absolutely not. Like I said before, I like to look at the root of problems like this, and I think that kind of a mindset, that I don't care mindset, is brought about by statism, that, that complacency. On top of that, you know, there's a lot of people that argue that children have a right to education, or we have a right to services. I disagree with that. 
Uh, you do not have a right to demand services from others, which is what public goods are. It is forced confiscation of taxes to pay for other people. Uh, what you do have a right to is life, liberty, and property. And the reason why you have a, a right to those three things and nothing else is because the exercising of those rights does not infringe on other people's rights. Demanding the right to education does infringe on other people's rights. Okay, but uh, people would argue that um, if you see children that are not being educated, they're deliberately being kept out of school by their parents, then they are being abused. They're being placed at a dreadful disadvantage from which they may never recover all their lives long. Isn't it the duty of the government to step in at this point and say, you're not doing the right thing by your kids, we've got to do something about this, we've got to intervene? No, I, I believe that the court of public opinion is stronger than any um, authoritarian court. If it was discovered that parents are doing these to their kids, their neighbors would bring pressure to bear on them. And you know what? Even if that didn't work, these things are going to happen. Uh, libertarianism is not uto utopia. You know, there are still going to be bad things that happen that no one can do anything about. But what libertarianism does give us is a society that is way, way better than what we have now. Okay. And do you have a strategy, um, a very broad strategy, for how you are going to convince enough people to actually uh, dismantle the government and uh, give us a libertarian society? Yes, I, I've, got, I've got to unlearn what they've learned, basically. I've got to convince people to drop this myth that freedom is chaos and that controls stability. If I can get people to accept that, if I can get rid of that status mindset, that idea that we need a, a father figure in our lives telling us what to do, I think everything else will fall into place. Okay, well on that note, I'm going to thank you very much, Sassan Sadat Sharifi, and wish you all the best of luck on your talk show and in your efforts to spread the good word of libertarianism. And that's all for tonight. I'm Joseph Dobrian. Join us next time for another edition of Hard Fight. Hardfire is funded in part by the Libertarian Party of New York. Catering for the cast and crew of Hardfire is generously provided by Da Vincenzo Restaurant, 256 Prospect Park West, Brooklyn, New York, 11215, 718-369-3590, www.davincenzorestaurant.com.